when we switched and we started looking at going through the books of the Bible, one of the things I said was the benefit we had of this, or one of the benefits, there were many, was that I didn't feel like you have to finish a lesson um, because there's a flow. So when we were doing Sunday school lesson books, a lot of times this lesson had nothing to do with the next lesson, and it was just very choppy. And it makes a statement when you're going through as a flow, you don't have to finish the lesson because basically it kind of leads into the next passage. And the reason I'm pointing that out, these last, the last two lessons, and this one and the next one, can almost be one big lesson. I know you didn't want to say they're four hours, so we brought them up. But you've got these, the same thought kind of flowing through. And this week, I'm going to tell you, probably will not finish this lesson. Uh, and I already know that. I would already kind of thought of that, kind of realized it yesterday when I was going back over it. And that's okay. And the reason I'm saying this, I want to emphasize, and you know this anyway, anytime you want to raise your hand and say, I got something to add to it, I got a question, please do so. And I, but I have sometimes people come up and say, I wanted to do that, but you know, didn't want to interrupt. That's fine with me, especially in this series, and especially today. I already know I'm not going to finish, uh, more than likely. But like I said, lately we've been taking the last passage that we concluded with has actually been the passage we use for the introduction. Last week we finished with chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. That's going to be kind of our introduction this week. Because again, it's all flowing together, and I'm going to spend quite a bit of time this morning hopefully tying all of it together and then get more into the lesson. So, but let's go ahead and start. Somebody read chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. All right, thank you. All right, let's start off. Let's picture that you're walking down a road. And you're walking down it this way. Here's the road, so we'll go ahead and we'll just put a ditch over here and a ditch over here. All right, let's suppose this road is kind of slick a little bit. It's easy to slide around. The wind is blowing hard, so it's kind of pushing you back and forth. And if you're not careful, you will fall into the ditch. That, in a way, illustrates the Christian life. Because Christ is right in the center perfectly, and none of us are. We kind of wander back and forth. And over in one ditch we've been talking about lately is legalism. And over in the other ditch is what we call license. That we really haven't dealt with yet, but that's what we're dealing with more today. And so what I'll do, the first question on the sheet, somebody describe the difference between these two. According to my source, Daryl, legalism is excessive adherence to law or formula. Excessive Adherence to law or formula. Good answer. All right, what about license? License is permit from an authority to own or use something. All right, say that again. A permit okay. from an authority to own or use something. Okay, good. All right, so you've got this um, situation where you've got <laughs> over here, the way I would describe it almost, I like his definition, legalism in, in Christian Christianity is to the point where, okay, to a certain degree, God didn't give us enough rules. So I, we've got the Bible, but we need to add to it. Now, I always know pretty much what I've got planned to say. But sometimes when I go home, it's like, okay, did I say that? Because I've gone over the lesson so many times in my head, I don't know if I said something or whether it was just planned to. So I may have said this last week. The Pharisees, remember, had all sorts of rules. They would take and add to so the law about the um, keeping the commandment of the Sabbath. Did I say this last week about they had a rule that you couldn't spit on Sabbath? Okay, I did. All right, remember, so one person saying yes, others are saying no. All right, so there was a rule where they wanted to help people not uh, violate the Sabbath so you couldn't spit. You know why? Because when you spit in the ground on the sand, on the dirt, what do you tend to do? You, well, you cover it, kick a little thing and cover it so you don't see it. So if you spit and somebody does like that, it kind of makes a little indention in the ground. A little indention is a type of trench. A trench is a type of ditch, and a ditch is working, and anybody that works on the Sabbath has violated the Sabbath. Therefore, their rule was don't spit. Wow. That is adding to. It's like, okay, we're helping you not violate the law, 
by making a rule that you couldn't spit. So that would be legalism. License, on the other hand, okay, so you've got all these legalistic rules. The people with license, they said, wait a minute, we don't want that. They start throwing off all these rules, but then they start throwing gods as well and saying, we don't need that either. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. Every one of us, and you may not agree, but all of us tend to go one of these areas or the other. The reason I say that is none of us are perfect. None of us are right here in the middle with Jesus Christ and just naturally perfect. No, we're not. We tend to go to one to the other. You might not get in the ditch, but we wobble back and forth. And so you have to determine, where are you? Naturally, where are you? I'll tell you where I naturally am. And I'm standing on the side where I would naturally be. And the reason has a lot to do, and I'm going to do this to explain, because it helps us understand sometimes other people. It has a lot to do with my upbringing. So I had an odd upbringing, and I don't mean that from a parent's standpoint, but just, and it may not be that odd, because maybe others did too, but it was like I was had areas of both extremes. So on one side of my family, hardly anybody went to church. The other side of the family, everybody did. So it was two different. In my neighborhood, very few went to church. I went to church, and I was at a Christian school. So I got a lot of differences. And it's not just differences. It was extremes. So in my neighborhood, even in family some, it wasn't that unusual to see the men might be passed out in the yard. And then you hear next door, drunk. And the next day you hear stories of how the wife was treated because he was drunk. A way he would never have treated his wife if he wasn't like that. The way he treated the kids. And I'd hear those stories. I'd be exposed to those things. Um, my, my granddad, uh, he, he made a profession of faith, uh, of faith before he died. I hope it was genuine. It's the only hope I have of seeing him. But he made one late in life. But he had nothing to do with the Bible or God until then. But growing up as a kid, when I'd go in his shop, you know, he'd hang, I'm assuming, came from Playboy, all these nude women on his walls. And as a kid, when I'd go in there to get blocks of wood or hammer and nails to play with or even tools to help grandma in the garden, you're exposed to all this. So all this, you know, and lots and other stuff is on one side of my family and raising. Over here, the other side of the family, they had a roof everything. I mean, <laughs> didn't leave it, having TVs, all sorts of stuff. And, and not just my family, but in other people. I mean, it went far enough, the things I was told. I remember being told this as a child, that it was a sin to see yourself nude. Whoa. To which I remember as a child, little said, don't you take a shower? <laughs> to which, well, of course I do. But I keep on my underwear. <laughs> to which I responded, even as a child, well, don't you have to change them? said, yes, I do, but I keep my eyes closed. And I thought, I know you, Pete, you're lying through teeth. Um, but all this stuff, there was all these rules, and I was exposed to all this type stuff to the point where I've got family members who have died, women who never, ever put on a pair of pants in their life. They were working in the garden, cutting grass. They had on a dress. And that's fine. I'm not knocking that. Um, People that are never, men or women, ever put on a pair of shorts because all of that was a sin. I remember when I'd go visit some of my family how we had to, different things. You know, it, it was just, you couldn't have on shorts. The women, the girls had to put on dresses just to go visit some people in the family. That was so much legalism over here. Come this side family, you do anything you want to. So here's what happened to me. The people that were over here, had nothing to do with God. The people over here, they did. They were in the Bible. They would talk about the Bible. They would go to church. And so here's what naturally happened to me. I was saved as a young child. I knew I wanted to serve God. I knew I wanted to obey God. I cared about the Bible. So what happened, I look at all those people over there. Okay, that's the way you are. And again, I, I'm, I'm naming extremes, but not all of it was extreme. But if that's how the people are that don't go to church and have anything to do with God, and if this is how the people are that want to serve God, that means I've got to be over here. And so that's where I kind of grew up in, not as far as some of this I'm naming, of course, but I grew up in some of that where I had all these rules and all these regulations, 
and I thought so much of that was about serving God. Where did my mind change? When I, I started studying the Bible, even as a kid, I, I you know do journaling and all this stuff, but when I started studying the Bible, verse by verse, through the Bible, is when so much of that changed, which is why my passion is studying verse by verse and teaching verse by verse through books of the Bible. That's where you learn. Because again, these people, they used a verse for everything they had, but they pulled it out of context. It looked good till you started studying the whole book. And so you have to decide, where are you naturally? Some of you are the other way. Maybe you grew up and, and it was all sorts of stuff going on. Maybe there was some sin. Maybe it wasn't sin. Maybe you were over on this side. But all the people you knew that were maybe a lot of them that were Christians over here that had rules, they were filled with, and we get into this in today's lesson, they were filled with wrath and anger and bitterness and envy and division, and they fought each other all the time over rules. Do you said, you know what, if that's what Christians are like over there, I don't want anything to do with their rules. Here are my Christian friends, and they're just free as a bird, and I'm going to stay over here. So we kind of get one side or the other. And I think we've got to be careful as Christians. I think we've got to be very careful as Christians because when I look at you, you may be naturally standing, you know, right over here. And another standing right over here, both serving God, but you just see it a little different. You'll see this in church. Okay, so you'll have a church that's more this way, that their worship sermon, they're singing, they got the lights out and they got lights flashing and you know blinking on stage, showing the people on stage. They're maybe over here. I know of churches like that. I know of churches like this that I'm getting ready to say, they believe when you come into the service, there's to be no talk. You walk in the service, full good music is playing, and you walk in and sit down quietly and just contemplate on God. I know churches like that. To me, it feels like a funeral. And to me, this feels like a concert. I'm not big on either one. I could worship God in either one, but it's not my preference. But you know what? You've got to be careful that we're not looking at other people and criticizing them and condemning them because they're not like us. We've got to work together. We've got to stay out of license. We've got to stay out of legalism. Because over here, remember, if you're in the ditch over here, you're saying, here's God's rules. I don't need them either. And that's what's going on big today. So we're casting off all rules, including God's rules. And that's where we cannot go. So the question is, second question, how will centering our focus on Christ help keep us out of sin and legalism? Christ doesn't change. His rules, laws, examples don't change. All right. He never changes. He is right here. If I look at Christ and I keep focused on him, and how do we keep our focus on Christ? Be in the Bible. Be in the Bible. So if I'm taking my beliefs and my practices back to Scripture constantly, saying, okay, does my belief, does my practice line up with Scripture? Is it just some legalistic rule? Is it just some license? Or is it with Scripture? And you know what? That can keep us fixed on him and more where we're supposed to be. Doesn't mean you're going to be perfect right there in the middle. You're still going to kind of wobble back and forth, even to the point we can be in the both ditches at the same time. That's how mixed up we are. You know, because think about this. You remember the guy I talked about last week that he was, you know, over here at least, and there were some things going on in his life that was definitely over here. But he made the statement, okay, and I told you my opinion, for those who won't hear, about alcohol. I don't believe the Bible condemns alcohol. I don't believe it says you cannot drink. And, you know, that's, I, I talked about that last week. But I also said I have nothing to do with it. And a lot of that's because I saw what went on in the family and, and friends and all this stuff. So all that. So I have one group saying I don't want anything to do with you because you don't preach that it's a sin to touch a drop of alcohol. But on this side, I've got... For instance, I don't want to fellowship with you because if you don't drink, if you don't exercise that liberty, I want nothing to do with you. You know what? What has happened? He's over here saying, I'm enjoying my freedom, but he's become a legalist, telling me that I have to do it or he's not going to fellowship with me. Come over here, and you've got all of your rules and regulations, and I've got you don't do things exactly like I do. You know what happens? God told you, you're still supposed to not judge me by your standard, but by Scripture. You're supposed to, as your brother in Christ, if I'm not in sin, you're to be fellowshipping with me, united with me. And you know what you're saying when I don't obey your rules? You're not going to fellowship with me? You just said, well, God's rules, they don't matter to me. So now I'm all of a sudden casting God's rules off. 
in order to have my legal advice. So you can be in both sides at the same time, which is kind of odd, but we can. And we got to really guard against this. We got to keep our focus on Christ. So third question, how does knowing that when he appears, then you will appear with him in glory affect you? Joy. All right, joy. The future secure. Future secure. <laughs> There's a hope. Very happy. Happy. All of that. Think about it, though, in light of this. Okay, you've got legalists divide from you, licensed people divide from you. But if you know you're striving to live your life for Christ, and when he appears, you're with him, does it really matter who's divided from you? And not only that, but those who have divided from you, if they weren't saved, they say, hey, he was actually right with God, and I wasn't. If they were saved, they realize... You know what? Yeah, I should have got along with the guy a little better. Um, all this stuff. So it lets us know that if I'm trying to live my life with Christ, when he appears, I'm going to be there with him, then all this stuff down here doesn't really matter. Because according to what he just said, we are dead in him. Think about that. That in him, in Christ, I'm dead. You know what that means? That means that I can't be judged for my sin. Now, Brian's an officer. He knows that if you're... You can't be convicted for the same thing twice, if you know, one thing, to the point that if I'm executed for my sin, for my crime against the state, there's no way they can execute me twice. I can only be executed one time. I am dead in Christ. There's no way I can be judged for my sins because my sins were judged in Christ. I know that's something that a lot of people don't like to hear, but it is. We can't be executed even to the point, he says, that we're dead with him, but our life is hidden with Christ in God. So that means that I am in Christ, not in legalism, not in license, not freedom to sin, not just piling all sorts of rules on other, top, other people. We'll see later. It's okay. If you want rules, that's okay. Because we talked about that a couple weeks ago. We want to get into that a little bit. But not piling them on other people. And so that's where we're going. And then remember that we'll be with him. And if that's not motivation to stay faithful, then you'll never have any. Knowing that we'll be with him. So if somebody read uh, verse 5 through 7. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetous, which is adultery. Because of these things the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. All right, thank you. So we've got, he names fornication, <coughs> uncleanness, Passion, evil desire, and covetous. Yep. All right, think about this list. When we start off at the top. Um, well, what does our world think about that list? They don't like it. They don't care. They don't care. They don't care. What about church? That's right. Some churches. Some churches don't. Right. But when you look at this list, think about it. Now, the word here in the Greek, and you're going to, not that you care about Greek, and I don't really know Greek, but I do study it. The word right there, I think I just spelled it wrong. Yep, evil eye. What word comes from porneia that we would have? It really stands out quickly. We recognize what word it is. It has to do with pretty much any sexual sin. It's a very broad term. Um, we think about that as being you know, fairly new because the, America has just exploded with it. I mean, it is so popular now that if you talk about the Bible standard that a, a man and a woman, that sex is only for a husband and wife, which is a man and a woman, then they mock you pretty much. You let a single people talk about, you know, I'm a Christian and I'm trying to save myself to marriage, and they get mocked. You'll hear that. It, it's terrible now because it's so rampant. But you know what? It's pretty much been like that throughout history. Remember what would happen with Israel? How that the other nations would capture them, get them in sin? What would they use? Remember? To lure, to lure them, not to beat them at war, but just to bring them down, they would use their women. They so they would, lure, they would lure the men away with their women, and they would even bring them, the women would then bring them into their false worship. So that was one of the big things. In Paul's day, 
it's hard for me to even imagine in Paul's day, as loose as our nation is today, it's hard for me to imagine that, that they actually had temples where to, to dedicate yourself to God, you know what you did? You became a prostitute. So think about the opposite of that in our day. We get, look at the Roman Catholics and think about a nun. A nun who is, I am totally dedicating myself to God, saving myself from marriage. I won't marry. I will be faithful to God, so to speak, dedicated completely to God in purity. In their day, they had temples that did the exact opposite. They became a prostitute for the temple, men or women. What that meant was this. Then when people wanted to worship their God, they went to the temple to enjoy their time with the prostitute. And it was so normal that we're told that they said that if you wanted to have babies, you got married. If you wanted pleasure, you went to the temple. Even to the women, even to the point that the husband and wife, this was normal. So if the husband says, honey, I'm going to worship today, she would say, have fun. And he'd be gone. I'll see you when I get back. And she comes back. That was their normal way of living. We'll talk about, um, may not, probably won't get to it, but at the end we talk about the immoral um, Greek. That was the way they lived their lives. That is horrible. Even, even most unsaved people, I would say, in our day, still say that you ought to stay faithful to your mate um, as a whole. And there are some that don't, but as a whole they think that. But if they think that we're crazy about saying that you're really to keep yourself pure for God, then they're really crazy when they start thinking about the uncleanness. That has to do more so with what's going on in our minds, the thoughts, even to the point that passion uh, and all this stuff kind of runs together. Passion has to do with the, uh, John MacArthur put it as those bodily desires, our fleshly desires, our fleshly actions, and the evil desire would be the, our thoughts. So kind of what Paul is doing here is this. We talk about something, let me put it up here. All right, first of all, what did Christ say about adultery? Remember the statement he made? He switched it to talking about not just adultery, but right here, what was the statement? If you uh, see. If you lust after a woman in your heart, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Paul is kind of doing the same thing. He's taking the actions and the passions. So he's saying it's not just the actions that are wrong, but even the passions that are wrong. Now, here's where legalism stands, at least my experience with legalism. So as legalists, people just check off the box. And the box they check is outward things. So I thought, you know, I was over here making sure, hey, I keep myself pure in so many different areas, but you're allowed to let your mind frolic in all sorts of filth. That I, was, that I thought I was fine doing because I checked off the box and because physically I hadn't done anything. Well, Paul is saying the same thing as Christ. It's not just what you do, but actually your thoughts and your passions to the point that a lot of times people, especially in this area, but in other areas as well, people ask the question. Young, um, a lot of times single people ask the question, how far can I go with my boyfriend or girlfriend before I cross the line in sin? And we draw a line. What Christ and what Paul did was said that line is a whole lot further back here than what we think. Because we think as long as I don't go through with the act, I haven't sinned. And Christ and Paul said, wait a minute. Even the desires of your heart, even the passions that you're following, they are sinful and we have to confess them. Now again, our world would look at that and think, you're crazy. But what we're getting to is, it's not enough for us to live over here in legalism and think that we're fine, because we still got all sorts of passions, and not just dealing with sexual, but all sorts of passions and desires that are evil, that we get into in our next part, which is talking about the wrath and the anger and things such as that. We've got these passions we've got to deal with. He goes down to covetousness. What's, what's, the, what's it mean to covet? <clears throat> okay. What are some things we covet? Bigger house. Bigger house. Newer car. All right, car. All right. Suppose I ride with somebody. We're going somewhere. I'm, I'm riding with you. A group of us going together, and I'm riding. I said, you know what? This is a really nice riding car. 
if I had to get another vehicle, well, I think I'd get one like this. Now, is that coveting? Do you think I'd covet? No, I just yeah. stated a fact. It's a nice riding vehicle. I'd like to have it. But when does it become coveting? Well, if I work on Sunday and I, I don't, you know, and I, I, I can get an extra job not and do things so I can get that new car. It said it's idolatry. And Brian hit on something. When does it become idolatry? When, when, before God. when we start putting it before God. So here's what happens. Okay, I, and it's not just things. We can look and say, that guy, pastors can do this. He has a lot bigger ministry than I have. I sure wish I had his ministry and just get the dwelling on it. We do that. Somebody's looks, somebody's popularity, bank account, all sorts of different things that we can start desiring, and it becomes the object of our desire to the point where I've got to have it, to the point where what he's talking about when it's something maybe uh, material, you know what? If I don't do as much at church, I'll have more time at work to be able to get more stuff. And while idolatry we think of as setting something on a shelf and bowing to it, we would never do that for a car, a boat, or whatever the case may be. But how many of us take at times and bow our families to that, our church time, our dedication to God, and all that stuff? How many times do we sacrifice those things so we can have more? It becomes our idol. It becomes something that we're seeking and pursuing, and it's got to hold our attention. We've got to have it. And that, Paul would say, is an idol. Even to the point he makes this statement, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. God is angry. Do you think we comprehend God's wrath and anger? No. I don't comprehend a God loving me so much that even though I was a sinner, he sent his son to die for me. I'll never fully comprehend that. But I will also never fully comprehend the wrath that he has such anger against sin that when the sinner stands before him in judgment, he sends that sinner to hell. That's how much he hates sin. I'll never comprehend it, but I'll tell you what, when I think about it, it should be enough to keep me away from it. Because it should be enough to say, I don't want to do that. I want to stay out of it. The wrath coming upon those who are disobedient. So now, if Paul says that the sons of these people that he's talking about who are over here living in all these things, if they're those people he's talking about are the sons of disobedience, what should we be called? Sons of obedience. Sons of obedience. Yeah. Why is that? We should want to obey God. The desire of our heart should be to obey him. And I think that's part of the problem with legalism, a lot of people in legalism, and I'm not saying a person who's in legalism or in license is necessarily lost. I don't mean to apply that at all. But you've got a lot of people over here in these rules that I knew and I know, and there's no doubt in my mind that they're saved. They're trying to pursue God. They're just going about it in the wrong way. They want God. They want to please God. So they think, if I check off all these, I please God more, and it's not really the case. And that's what happens. But don't come over here fighting it and saying, well, now I can live and do whatever I want to do because God has rules. We talked about the traditions, man-made stuff the last two times. We said that stuff doesn't last. These do. These rules will last for eternity. God will never say, I'm taking away the rule of fornication and you can go on and do what you want to. But there's a reason why they last because they're God's. They're founded upon God's word. And one of the biggest tests we have to see if we're saved is, am I obeying God? Am I living my life striving to obey him as best I can? Yes, we'll fail. Yes, we'll blow it. But we should obey him. So the question is, um, what do we do? What does Paul say do concerning these sins? Question number six. Put them off. Put them off. He actually talks about being put to death. Now, I guess in a way, I wish it was a physical fight where you could go out and fight your passions, you know, pull out a gun or a knife or whatever and fight my passions and kill them and be done with it. It doesn't work that way. We still have those desires, those evil desires, they're still real. Paul helps us in Romans 6, and we'll turn there. Um, I know I mentioned Romans 6 a couple weeks ago and told you we'd probably look at it. I do want to look at it. I want to take time to do it. Romans 6, 11 through 13. 
Because it's not enough just to know that we're to stay out of sin. We need to know how to stay out of sin. And that's what he deals with in Romans 6. So Romans 6, if somebody read verse 11 through 13. Likewise, <coughs> you also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. How much? 13. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but persist. Present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. All right, thank you. All right, so question number seven. How does this passage help us deal with sin and sinful desires? You know, not that Christ is at all who accept him. Number one, number two. Um, clothe yourselves in righteousness and with each other's respect. All right, we're to clothe ourselves in righteousness. Paul's going to talk about that. This is actually the next lesson we get into where it's not just getting rid of the bad, but putting on the right. That was where I was in legalism. Make sure I have nothing in my life that's sinful, but it was like nobody was telling me, hey, you got to have the right attitudes. Not just get rid of the wrong, but have the right actions and the right attitudes. Uh, and that goes on. Paul right here talks about that he presents it like this. Sin no longer has power over you if you're in Christ to demand that you obey. Instead, it has to ask permission from the parts of your body, whether that's your eyes, your hands, or whatever, to sin. He says, do not yield yourself to sin. Remember how James put it, that there's a lure that draws us, and he used the illustration of a bait with a fish. So you've got that bait, and it lures you. Paul is saying, don't let sin lure you and, that, and make you think that you have to obey it because you don't. What you're to do is give yourself to Christ. And I love the illustration he gives. You don't get it in the English, but in the Greek, the word for obey, from what I understand, is the word that you would use if you hear a knock at your door and you go to the door to listen to see who it is. Now, if you heard a, you know, if you heard a knock at the door, how many of you just run and open the door up? Most people. My wife won't go. If she does if she's there, she's not going to the door unless she knows you're coming. Or if she looks out and sees your car and knows it's you, she might. But she's not going to. All right, so a lot of people would. Two o'clock in the morning, you hear something outside your door. Anybody just open the door and welcome on in? No. Nah. Probably not. We use a lot more caution. This is the word says when you're listening, so here's the illustration. When sin starts luring you, don't listen to its offer. That's where we mess up. Because we're right here. How close can I get to sin? So we hear that you know, sin knocking on our heart's door, and we're like, you know, this really looks good. This really seems pleasurable. Because it is. Sin is pleasurable for a season. And we try to get just as close as we can without sinning. And what happens? It just keeps drawing us and drawing us into its sin. Paul says, don't do that. Don't give your ear to listen. Don't give your eyes to look. Don't give your feet permission to take you there. Instead, make sure you're using your body for God and for righteousness. And going back to Colossians, he talks about death. And death in Scripture is often a separation. So when he says, put to death these things in your life. So all these things, put it to death. That doesn't mean you can do away with your desire. I can't kill my desire. I wish I could, but I can't do it. I can't kill that. But he says, put it to death, which is like this. Separate yourself from it. Going back to a couple weeks ago, a question we were asked about standards. And you, was, and, and you pointed out that I mean, it seems like if we're not careful, we're throwing away standards. All right, here's where I wanted to put with that. When it comes to standards, it's fine for you to set up standards. Here's an example. Let's suppose you're a person who has a problem with alcohol. Maybe you were an alcoholic before you got saved. And if you get around it, especially if you go to a restaurant that has a bar, it, it just pulls you there. And it gets on your mind, and you can't get it off your mind. And before long, you end up drinking when you think you shouldn't be. And you end up drunk and all this stuff. Or even if you don't, you just can't say no to it. If you want to set up a standard say, I'm not going to a restaurant that has a bar, you know what? That's fine for you. You don't have a right to come to the next person and say, 
you're not allowed to go to the restaurant. Maybe they don't have that problem. But if that's what helps you put to death those desires, that's fine. Well, another situation, maybe you got a problem. If I see a woman in a bathing suit, I'm gonna be lusting. So I'm gonna set a rule, I can't go to the beach or to the lake or, or a pool. If you want that rule and that helps you, fine. But that doesn't have a right, you don't have a right to come up to me and say, you can't go to the beach. But if that's what helps you, Paul is saying, put to death. I mean, that's pretty extreme. Put it to death. If it takes you setting up that standard to stay away from anything like that, by all means, do it. If that's what it takes. Just don't go to the point of legalism and saying, I'm going to put it on everybody else. That's the problem I had so much of what I grew up with was that, okay, it wasn't just a rule for me. It became a rule that was preached and pounded. And I know of where they would pre preach the sin of television sets to the point where the preacher would say, if I ride by your house and see that antenna on your house, I'm coming in there, ripping that TV out because you ain't seeing it. You know, stuff like that. Yeah, if he wanted a standard where he didn't have a TV, that was fine. He had no right. I'll even say this, he better not come to my house rip my TV out of, uh, out of the house. Um, it doesn't have that right. That's setting up something that God didn't do. We notice in verse 8 through 9. And we'll just, con we'll just read it enough to comment and pick it here up, Lord willing, next week. I'm going to read verse 8 and 9. But now put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old self with its practices. All right, thank you. Here's my question. What's the difference between that list? Again, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, lying. What's the difference between that list and the other? Actions. Actions? One is actions? What about this? How many in the church would stand here and fight all day that that sin? Anger? Wrath? being mad at each other. How many of us wallow in it? That's prevalent in our churches. And I've seen that where there's so much division and people can't get along and they fight each other over foolish stuff often. And so it becomes something where when we get into this next week, you'll say, okay, this is preaching. Next week we're going to be meddling because we're going to get to where we more likely live. Most of us probably not over here but maybe our thoughts and our attitudes don't line up. And then we move into the attitudes. It's not enough to get rid of the wrong attitudes. Paul says in our next lesson that we'll be in uh, next week, he says we've got to have the right. And that's where I struggled so much of my life where I didn't realize I had to do that. And again, I thank God for preachers that helped me get into the Bible verse by verse and understand that and learn it. John MacArthur was one of the ones that help me with that more than anything. Chuck Swindoll, and, and many of them. I shouldn't name them because there were so many of them. But they helped me do that. And all that does benefit because we do have to deal with sin. We're Yes, we deal with sin, but we also have got to seek to honor God through the things that we do that are right and the right actions and attitudes. Any questions or comments? All right, so Paul is telling us to get rid of these things Next week, Lord willing, we'll see what we're some more things to get rid of, and then things that we're to add to our lives. So, um, bring your sheets back from this week and pick up the sheet for next week. So, we plan on doing both of them next week. Somebody want to dismiss us in prayer? Father God, we thank you so much for allowing us to spend these last and understand, get into the Word, and try our very best to have a total understanding of all these words. Looking to Christ for the direction we need to, to behave ourselves and to be the kind of people you created us to be. We thank you so much, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. We pray, God, that everyone here listens to that Spirit as it moves in us and direct our path. Let us always be honest and truthful to that Spirit, my Father, that we might walk in a righteous manner and be pleasing to you. We just so thank you for what, what's going to happen here today in the preaching service. We pray, Lord, that all of you bless and what you bring to us. We just thank you, praise, and love you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.